guys for coming. This is a very steep audience. Um, Towering over you. guys are going to fall on us. I, um, I, uh, uh, I'm really excited to be here with, with Donna, I've known for a while now. And um, I think, you know, I, I want to just kind of begin with, with just one question of like maybe an opportunity to introduce yourself in a larger sense and then maybe you'll read a little bit from, from the book. But, um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways in which one can introduce oneself is, you know, pick up the book and read the first page. Um, but because we're an event, maybe the thing to do is, to, is to, to bring up that you are the latest installment of a, um, of a very serious family of writers, right? And um, maybe you can kind of lay out what that family is and, uh, and how much you hate the fact or love the fact <laughs> that you're a part of it. <laughs> In the family, there is also always the hate and love uh, element. <laughs> and first of all, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I'm really excited. So um, let's go straight to the question. <laughs> um, I come from, a, I'm proud to come from a family of female authors. And my mom, is a writer and poet, uh, and after a bit, my grandma uh, is a, a journalist and an author that wrote over 30 books that unfortunately I did not know well, um, Orochimu, that was one of the pioneers also of uh, suspense books in Israel. She did everything, and I really admire her. And my aunt, uh, Miri Chimu, uh, writes poems, and she wrote most of the biggest hits of uh, with Speak a Pick, uh, when they, after they divorced, they did not speak with each other and they only communicated but by sex. And now she's also the mother-in-law of uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino, so really <laughs> are a, a family of ruling women. And uh, I should say that, that <laughs> thing is, uh, for people who might not know, is a, uh, a songwriter kind of, maybe it's a cliche, but referred to often as Sort of the Bob Dylan of Israel. Uh, For others who don't know, Quentin Tarantino is an American filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, in, the, in Israel, yeah, gossip people were very uh, at all. They could not think of a of a, of a baby that is a, that has a Quentin Tarantino as a, as a father and speak a bit as a grandfather. So it's very for Israel, it's a killer combination. <laughs> so so um, when you think about it, you say you're very proud to come from not just this family of, of writers, but the female writers. Um, this was never anything that gave you anxiety, or, or was it something, you know, how did it play a role in your, in your early life and having to write? Good question. <laughs> um, I do. When I began writing, in fact, I was, I think, 10 years old. And then, 13 years old, I already uh, published my first book. It was not the official publication, but uh, so I was always engaged in writing, even though I didn't read a lot. And by but I think now that just being part of a, a family of writers just immersed me in that world. So I didn't even think about it, so there was no room for anxiety. But then, growing up. Uh, for sure, anxiety has found its place. <laughs> yeah, anxiety will find you. <laughs> so, so maybe with that, we will, we will, you know, turn to the book, which certainly partakes of an enormous amount of anxiety. Would you like to, to um, read a small portion of it and maybe kind of give people the, um, you know, where, where this, this happens in the book? Yeah, I would love it. Maybe before I do that, now that I think about anxiety, I can add okay. one thing. Because in that part of the joke, there is not a, lot, a, a big amount of anxiety. I would say just one thing regarding to that, that I describe in the novel a woman that is really full of, of, of anxiety. And I feel that this woman um, that has 
OCD, uh, like the, uh, how do you say, like little things that she really want, everything would be in order, that she really feel uh, obligation to be perfect all of the time, and that comes with the expense of going a lot to the bathroom maybe, or just feeling very, she needs to find a place. So this anxiety that I wanted to really express when I described the hood, uh, I found a, a universal, that, that is a phenomenon that uh, many women, modern women, share today. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, th there's a way in which, uh, you know, in the beginning of this book, where um, if you'll let me say this, where where it, it's it's a a um, it's an Israeli specifically, you know, an Israeli Jewish Mrs. Dalloway setup, which you know, if you really think that through, that's a nightmare. Right, of, uh, but instead of someone planning a party or going out to get flowers for a party, it's a woman who's preparing a dinner party um, for her partner and really the partner's friends. And so it's 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 a person who is um, it's a non-French person who's cooking in France. Exactly. So you know, there's that. Let's add pressure to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, adding pressure to it. And there's also the sense that um, that there are multiple tests that are being presented here. Um, there are the, the tests that she, you know, perceives others are, are, are imposing on her, and then there's the ones that she is giving to herself. And so I think the section you're going to read really kind of is a, a, toward the beginning of the book, and, and, and it, 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 it describes sort of the, uh, the table being I'm ready. <laughs> okay. In fact, I will, I will add it. I, I, it was difficult for me to find an accept. And, uh, and it's very interesting, in fact, how uh, at the end I, I talked with Joshua and he, he proposed me that because we think of what can... The protagonist is a translator, so also when, you cho we, when we chose uh, an accept, we should think what is interesting for the Americans. So, so there is a lot of things to take into consideration. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> the table was overflowing with a rich selection of fine foods. Almost all the dishes were vegetarian to accommodate Katya's lifestyle, one of the best. Jean-Claude, the husband, has conducted some research about the couple's culinary preferences ahead of time. The menu was eclectic, an indication of the cook's curiosity. At the center of the table, in a wide blue ceramic tray, the newly burned bruschetta was neatly arranged alongside a pair of baguettes to enrich the offering of carbohydrates. Alongside the tray was a bowl of artisanal hummus, it bought in Le Marais, extra virgin first press olive oil, and balsamic vinegar. On the right end of the table, near the Greek Oreps, the, the important couple, <laughs> was a bowl of fluffy mashed potatoes surrounded by small dishes of steamed vegetables. Next to the broccoli was a challenging dish Jean-Claude had decided to try for the first time that night. Tomatoes stuffed with foie gras and chantry. On the left end, beside the Mosqueta and in same Italian vein, a tray of fried artichokes, a traditional dish favored by the Roman Jews that Jean Claude had learned from his friend and colleague Daniel Finzi, and of which he was especially proud. Next to the artichoke, close to the artichoke and Antoine, was a deep bowl of Greek salad and spinach and goat cheese quiche that Jean Claude had purchased early that morning. I hope you're not hungry. Okay. <laughs> Focused on eating, Reut hadn't noticed the first collective hush that had fallen since the beginning of the evening. The hush resulted not from any lull in conversation, but rather of each di dinner diner's obedience to their rumbling stunts. It was Rigore to polish off his plate, who broke the silence. Oh, where's the hal? he asked, as if just recalling a question of utmost importance. Hala? 
thank you Lord Spartan. So we're about to follow first the shock. <laughs> oh no, I'm not observant, the old explained. And Jean-Claude is, Katuska's family is traditional, Gregorov said, cutting her off. I'm very fond of your Friday night ritual. Bien, Jean-Claude murmured, c'est bien. Grégor paid no heed to Jean-Claude's mumbling. His mind wandered back to a question Louis had asked about a book he was now writing, which led to a conversation that lasted several minutes. At the time, a few other side conversations harmoniously played out. Some banter between Réout and Antoine, a fervent discussion between Stéphane and Patrice, who raised her voice significantly in an attempt to surface through this volume, the small scale exchanges quickly expanded to include three people, with a few individuals left out on their own. Meanwhile, Jean Claude jumped restlessly from one conversation to the next, struggling to keep engaged. He was mostly preoccupied with his discovery of Katla's Jewishness, a fact he overlooked in his research on the Papen. Raised Catholic, and an avowed atheist and existentialist since coming of age, Jean Claude could not imagine a life revolving around religious ritual. What he found most vexing, as it often told the hood, was the belief that a series of practices could accord a person their life's meaning. The thought that from birth onward, a person methodically strives to detach their life from their thinking self, from their dreaming self, a wish to redeem one's soul by conforming to the herd. When I would heard his, he made this kind of statement, she would nod and listen patiently until he finished. What good would it do to voice her opinion on the matter, or even share her puzzlement at the amusing, almost ironic gap between his field of academic research, religious philosophy, and his critical view of spiritual life. Which is, you know, can I be French as, as well as the French can, right? Can I, can I convincingly speak this language, translate this language, cook its food, um, mother and child, and it's really when it comes to the child that um, that in this book the um, those buried anxieties come out. Yeah. And and I, I, I kind of wanted to, to to speak you know about that. There's this idea that um, you know there's this idea that 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 identity is suspended for her, but um, but there's the idea that identity must be provided for the child. Um, how is that important? I mean, as someone who had an identity crammed down my throat as a child, my reaction to it is, don't do that, right? Um, and you're right, but um, but but I also know a lot of people who, who who haven't had that or didn't have that, and um, and you know, I'm not saying they have fewer problems than I do; they just have different problems. Go ahead. And so I, I wanted to ask about um, that moment of, 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 of the child yeah. in the book. I think also the question of her giving her identity for the child, it is not always like that. Everything parents do in a way is also concerns them. Because the old, for example, she would have been very delighted if Julian Kusak spoke Hebrew, but he did not uh, learn it. He was very uh, uh, antagonistic toward this language. So it is important for her like, to give him this identity, but more, mostly because to feel that her son is not a stranger. She, there is a paragraph where I, I said how sometimes she listened to her son, and suddenly while he's speaking, her mind just drifts for other places and then she just hears a voice that is speaking completely in French accent. And I think that many parents could identify with this problem, with this, with this 
reality that her, that her children speak another language completely in the, in the accent. So she said like he dreams in, in French, she speaks, he loves in French. So this is a barrier that will always separate them. So it's not only about giving the Ghana the identity of a Jewish or Israeli, but it's also how to maintain herself like this visceral uh, closeness to one another. There's, you know, it, it's in, in very broad strokes. Um, if we were going to, which I think is, is necessary for the discussion, you, you separate the idea of um, Israeli literature from, from Hebrew literature, right, for a moment. And when you look at, um, you know, the people who were famous and read um, when we were children, when we were growing up, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm older than you, but close enough, right? And, um, and you know, there, there, there certainly is, you know, there, there, there was early state literature that was all about asserting Israeli identity. Um, then there were um, more recently attempts to address um, the biases in that, what is left out, you know, especially largely because the Israeli literature was largely Ashkenazi and, 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 and included many, forgetting the fact that it obviously excluded the Arab experience enormously. Um, you see, though, really recently, um, this idea of the, you know, sort of Israeli in, in the world. And, um, and I'm wondering, just from, you know, from your experience of, 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 of writing this book and talking about this book, um, do you feel that um, you're constantly being asked to represent that? And then when you're not, you're being asked to represent the woman who is expected to cook the meal. And when you're not asked to represent that, you're being asked to, you know, explain France to people. So I, I guess my question is, how do you, how do you, do you write against that? Because it seems to me that sometimes you, you, you specifically write against the, the expectations of the reader that you would be represented in these things. I'm a warrior. <laughs> about Jewish and, and if not Jewish, so Israeli themes. And of course there is always a difference, but and specifically if Israeli want to have success in the world. So there is one thing to write to Israeli and, and, and another I heard it a lot. Like if you're Israeli and if you want to be published abroad, then it's even the more you should write the Jewish themes because the people expect certain things. And in certain uh, amount, it is correct because uh, literature should be no literature should not be anything else. Mm, to write a micro uh, history, to write something that is close to you that you can talk about, uh, it's also always uh, fascinating for people. They want to read something that is close to you. So of course there will be this expectation, and in Israel even more. Uh, because of the war. So in Israel, I just felt very strongly that people around me and uh, write about kibbutz, uh, very successful books about politics, <laughs> uh, about uh, my grandma wrote Retzach, uh, Retzach is a murder, Retzach in the Knesset, murder in the Knesset, murder in Shaky. <laughs> so uh, we are in that uh, era. And, uh, and me, like you, there was traveling and, and, and in a way I I haven't written for for decade from 13 to 40 for 24 and I I, I just had this alarm like this like push that I wanted to write after I've been to Paris and I read uh, French books. So in, in a way I almost was inspired of writing in a way that was completely not um, far away from Israeli um, literature and and many people who did not know how to react also to the writing because also the, the you would not say it in, in English uh, but I changed a bit the phrase so I wanted to write about you so in a way I tried to, to escape I think but 
when I think about it, also I could not really stay because I didn't even know this when I wrote about the you know, who lives in Paris and she's not in Israel. And that is, is a book about an Israeli woman, and uh, there is a lot of Israel experiences. Uh, I describe it all in the taxi, and uh, this is a very common experience for um, people uh, in Israel that are in Europe. And then there is the Ahmad, or uh, like a. Uh, <laughs> You they don't know how to present themselves. Should I say I'm from Israel? Should I not say I'm from Israel? So these kind of scenarios, uh, I really wanted to describe the experience of an Israeli that is abroad and yes. I'm so excited that I, I translated uh, for one year and a half uh, two novels of Chana Ling that uh, she's also available in very picture. So uh, and in Hebrew, in fact. Even if it's letters, uh, the the images are there all of the time. Door um, to penetrate, like the, the roots are just images. So in fact, when I saw a huge resemblance, and the and the the, the how to say the expression, the like the beam, I saw idioms. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> They're all of the time. So um, yeah. Thank you for bringing my journey. I'm very happy. <laughs>